Uh, to give the best example of how bad it was, Colin Powell's speech at the United Nations shortly before the U.S. invasion, and President Bush's press conference shortly before the invasion, this sort of the two opportunities for the press to deal with the case uh, being made by leaders to take us to war. In the case of Colin Powell's press conference, uh, the response to that talk by U.S. news media across the board was one of un uh, unimaginable praise, of the great evidence that was brought forward, how this is the case was closed, our media said. And a recent study by a former reporter from the Des Moines Register has gone through all the media and basically chronicles it. There were no dissenting voices in our mainstream press, radio, television, newspapers, magazines. The case closed. Colin Powell settled it for all time. Well, six months later, uh, a reporter for the Associated Press fact-checked the speech for the first time, said it was entirely full of flaws. There was no evidence to support any of the claims. They don't hold up at all. Six months later, well after the war was, was, was had long since begun, Scott Ritter, the weapons inspector, the former Marine, uh, the Republican, who'd been on the ground in Iraq and came back and said, these claims are ridiculous. I've been there. I was part of the weapons inspection. They don't have weapons of mass destruction. Uh, was given a character assassination by the Bush administration that made it more difficult for a network news show to have him on the air as an expert than it would have been to have Michael Jackson on as an expert. I mean, it was just he was simply absolutely obliterated from legitimacy. Uh, although evidence has now proven him to be 100% correct on every single point he made. It's been backed up and enforced, but he was treated like a lunatic by our news media. Now, why is it? Why did our press system in the United States do such a dreadful job of uh, preparing people for the war and then covering the war and occupation uh, after hostilities commenced? It's not an easy thing to answer. There's not a simplistic answer, but I think there are two or three crucial factors that have to be considered. First of all, uh, we have... Uh, a code of professional journalism that's developed in the United States over the past hundred years that's developed in a peculiar way uh, where it regards what people in power say is the source of legitimate news and people outside of power are not considered the source of legitimate news. So if a reporter just reports what the president says and the head of the Democratic Party says, assuming the president's a Republican, and reports on their debates, that's considered objective, neutral, professional journalism. Now if they're both lying, you're just out of luck. You're reporting lies as if they're the truth. Uh, and if someone's telling the truth outside of power, they if you report on their uh, comments seriously, you're considered being partisan. Why are you weighing in their opinions? No one, you know, they're not in power. Uh, it's one of the real problems built into the way professional journalism is developed in the United States. And I hasten to add that professional journalism need not be that way. There's nothing intrinsic to the notion of having professional journalism that means it must uh, be dependent upon what people in power say is legitimate news. In the 1930s in the United States, the founders of the newspaper guild, George Seldes and Haywood Broom, argued, in fact, it's in the Newspaper Guild's charter, this is charter, this is the Union of Print Journalists in the United States, that we needed to have a professional journalism that wasn't dependent on official sources, but in fact was critical of everyone in power on behalf of the general public, that it had to see its role as being outside of power altogether, being independent, but not being partisan, not picking one party over another, and subjecting everyone to harsh criticism. And that was their vision of what a bona fide professional journalism is. Another crucial factor has to be we see highly concentrated ownership uh, of our news media in the United States, as we see around the world, in a very small number of corporate hands. Uh, the actual people who control news in particular, over television in this country, who generate news, you could fit the owners of those companies in a table. It's a very small group of people that, that do this and that cover wars, that send out the reporters. If you add the print companies, you might have to add a few more chairs at the end, but not much more. You can get them around a table of 12 for all intents and purposes. These are companies that, by definition, are going to be small C conservative. They're beneficiaries of the status quo. They're run by extraordinarily wealthy and powerful individuals who think the world looks pretty good just the way it is. And in any organization, they're going to send the vibes down the, the implicitly, if not explicitly. This is the way the world looks. We like it this way. And those who succeed in the institution are always going to adopt those values. The problem with that, and the problem with what the corporations, uh, corporate news firms have done to our journalism, is that that means they depend almost entirely on the State Department and the White House to set the cue for what the debate should be about. And they have no evidence on their own to say, well, wait, what about this? We were over there. We saw what was going on in Afghanistan. That's not what we saw. No one's challenging them. The journalism then more and more becomes a regurgitation of what people in power say without a critical impulse. But to the general public, it looks like real news. It looks like real journalism. And that has been a deep fundamental problem of commercially run uh, news as it's developed in very uncompetitive markets in the United States.
There's one other great domestic uh, example of the problems of our news in the United States, and one that needs to be talked about, and is almost never mentioned, because people just take it for granted now, and that's the spectacular class bias of U.S. journalism. Back in the 1930s and 1940s, it was standard for every daily newspaper to have at least one or two labor editors and beat reporters. It was understood that the working class, the laboring classes, were a significant part of the community, and news that affected them was central news uh, that, that had to be covered for a viable uh, journalism operation or an outlet. Um, by the 1980s or 1990s, that position basically was discontinued in U.S. news media. You can't find very many labor editors. On the other side of the coin, however, interestingly enough, uh, we've seen a vast increase in business journalism, business reporting. I mean, it's, it's skyrocketed in the past two decades. Uh, you know, some newspapers have much larger business sections than they do have news sections at this point.